Ugh. Andre Sapowski. Sapowski. <laughs> Cut, take two, take two. Andre Sapowski. Hey everyone, Bessie is here with another video. In this video, I want to do a book review on An Andre Sapowski. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, the second book in the Witcher series, I'm kind of skipping the first one called The Last Wish. Uh, this one is The Witcher, Sword of Destiny. And I would say that the first and second book kind of go together in the fact that they're mostly an anthology of the actual series, more of a precursor leading into the official plot, the official narrative of the next six books after these first two because every chapter is a short story that is in a different period of time from the next um, or last. The characters primarily following Geralt the Witcher, which um, most of us may or may not have heard of before. The Witcher is a very popular series on Netflix and also a very popular video game series as well, specifically The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. So I wanted to talk more specifically about the second book, The Witcher Sword of Destiny. And in this review I want to go over some of the, the main plot points and just my thoughts on it. I just finished it and I felt like making a video talking about it. A big point of this book is the introduction of Ciri, which is kind of Geralt's like daughter figure that he protects throughout the series, which is a very big part of the narrative. Um, especially in this book, kind of the introduction of that character. She's the granddaughter of Queen Calanthe. I'm gonna tear this down quick. <laughs> Alright, that was getting really intense. She's the granddaughter of Queen Calanthe, who is the queen of the kingdom called Sintra. And Ciri's parents died at sea, going from Skellige to Novigrad, I believe. And Queen Calanthe was talked about more in depth in the Last Wish book, but she's also brought up in this book as well, and Geralt and her have a very interesting dynamic because she is a very uh, disciplinary and very authoritative leader, it seems like, but she definitely has a soft spot for Geralt because I think she sees some of herself in him. But the beginning of this book kind of goes over this narrative of tracking down this gold dragon who is later known as Three Jackdaws and Geralt is working alongside Dandelion to find this dragon and there's also a band of a few other people as well that goes and tries to track down this dragon but it turns out this dragon is extremely intelligent and can also speak and is a very formidable target and it turns out that the dragon in the end was disguising as a human who had previously met Geralt in the beginning of the chapter and they had formed somewhat of a an agreement or uh, somewhat of a friendship early on. So it was kind of interesting seeing that. And Yennefer was also in this chapter and Geralt and Yennefer have a very complicated on and off romantic dynamic between each other. And it's very interesting to kind of hear Geralt's inner dialogue regarding this relationship that means a lot to him. He definitely has a lot of feelings for her and somewhat of an obsession. And it's it's interesting to dive into that, as well as the own the uh, conception that witchers do not have any emotions or any feelings whatsoever. So kind of that contrast, because Geralt is a very sensitive person even if the rituals of becoming a witcher may have stripped some of that humanity from him, this book kind of delves deeper into that and reveals that Geralt is actually an incredibly emotionally complex character, which I find to be one of the more compelling parts throughout the book. And in Sword of Destiny and The Last Wish, we definitely see that a lot because there's a lot of scenarios that happen that reveal Geralt's own empathy and inner conflicts regarding maybe killing someone or a certain monster. He definitely has a very nuanced perspective of the world and most of the world around him sees him as a very one-dimensional uh, cold-blooded killer when that's very far from the truth. So I find that extremely compelling in this book. 
And this uh, scene with the dragon was also in season one of the Netflix Witcher show, which I also found interesting. Moving on, another big plot point in this book was somewhat of a love triangle between Geralt, Yennefer, and a sorcerer named Estreed. And it was very interesting because this, this chapter in the book really focused on Geralt's inner conflicts with his conceptions of emotion and his own self-criticism and doubt regarding how he truly feels about things. He really likes to play off the fact that he's a witcher. <coughs> Excuse me. He really likes to play off the fact that he's a witcher and doesn't feel emotions somewhat as a emotional bypass to use as a crutch to get out of certain instances where he would otherwise be very emotionally vulnerable or susceptible to feeling what it is to be human and I think one of his deep uh, protective inner mechanisms is to use that identity of being a witcher as a crutch to push people away so he doesn't have to face the fact that he is a very vulnerable character. And that is definitely on highlight in this chapter. Estreed is a sorcerer who has had a long-term romantic on and off relationship with Yenner, Yennefer throughout the years. And it kind of puts Geralt in a different position, being that he has been with Yennefer romantically, but it has been a very recent thing in comparison with the Street and Yennefer's relationship being something that's been unraveling for years. And there's a lot of conflict, obviously, between Street and Geralt because they both love and desire to be with Yennefer. But we see that Street talks about Yennefer using a different nickname. Geralt calls Yennefer Yen, and Street calls Yennefer Yenna, I believe. So they it reveals their own unique relationship that they have with this character. And Estreed talks about what he knows about her and all of the things that he knows about her that Geralt doesn't. So it really thrusts Geralt into a position of feeling inadequate to be with Yennefer in the first place. And they want to fight each other and they agree to fight each other to the death basically. And whoever wins, won't be with Yennefer in the end because Yennefer will reject whoever wins the fight for killing someone just to be with her because she's a very independent character who the last thing she'd want to do is be with someone because they killed someone else to be with her. Like That is very far from her character. And in the end, they don't actually kill each other. Uh, Yennefer writes Estreet a note basically saying that she doesn't want to be with him in the end and Geralt walks away from the fight. It's a really, really interesting narrative. I don't want to focus too much on the plot in this video because I, I don't want it to be a simple summary. I kind of want to just talk about my thoughts of it mostly. But I, I thought it was a very compelling chapter for understanding Geralt a little better of his psychology and also Yennefer as well, seeing how she uh, talks to Geralt and also Estreed as well. She's a very complex and I think methodically written character. We don't really know a lot about her yet up to these two books, just bits and pieces of her, but she seems like a very reserved character, very similar to Geralt in pushing people away and it being very difficult to kind of open up um, around her. And I think it's interesting to have Geralt and Yennefer together because they have a very similar dynamic in that. And I think ultimately a very conflicting dynamic, which we will definitely see in the later books, potentially. Moving on, I wanted to talk about another plot point. There was a hobbit or a halfling named uh, Dainty Bilbervelt. Uh, Bibbervelt, Bibbervelt, Dainty Bibbervelt. I'll just say Dainty. He's a merchant. And he's friends with Dandelion, which is the bard that accompanies Geralt. Also, I just want to mention Dandelion and Geralt's dialogue together. They have extremely good chemistry. Their dialogue is very compelling. And I like that Dandelion is always picking apart at Geralt's character. And it's kind of the audience insert that 
would be very self-aware of Geralt in the first place and understanding his character and kind of picking that out in the dialogue. So I think it's just a really fun dynamic and I really love reading what Dandelion has to say. He's extremely eloquently written and very funny and witty and I just love whenever I see him on, in the book. But moving on from that, there is a Doppler, like a doppelganger kind of species that can mimic physically what another being looks like. Any other race or like species of anything, even a wolf. The, the Doppler can turn into a wolf and join the pack and kind of mimic all of that. But this Doppler happens to knock unconscious this merchant, turn into him, and kind of go in back into the city and make very intelligent financial decisions and trades. He's kind of playing the market in this city and buying, basically the stock market, buying shares of certain resources that he would predict would appreciate over time because a certain event would occur, a certain war would happen, which would mean this resource would go up because this other town's not able to get it. And he basically made thousands of uh, gold profit. I think that's the central currency, gold. But this merchant, we are introduced to him in a tavern with Dandelion. He's a good friend of the merchant. And the halfling is very uneasy at first. Seeing Geralt, a witcher, a monster tracker. And it turns out that the dainty we see in the tavern, who is completely playing the role of this merchant, is the Doppler, and he's trying to run away, and they pretty much detain him, and Geralt uses a certain, I think it's a silver handcuff, which counteracts the Doppler's ability to transform, and he turns into like a white blob with yellow eyes, and it's just like really interestingly written about like what this creature looks like in a natural form. It basically seems like it's unable to really do anything without being able to turn into something. But we also see that Geralt is empathetic towards this creature because most of the time a Doppler is using their abilities as a survival mechanism basically to protect itself and blend in with the environment rather than being used as an offensive ability to attack or kill people. And it seems like it's a really rare species of, of being that is just trying to get by in the world and trying to survive. And it really makes the world feel more nuanced. It's not a black and white world where there's good guy humans, bad guy monsters, kill monster, good, human survive, good. It's, it's very nuanced and I think there's a lot of parallelism in this world with kind of the the idea of colonization in our world and people taking over land and invading and killing and to to take over land and kind of gain power just the uh the human element there of wanting to have control and power and that is kind of what we're seeing in this world of this world being full of different diverse creatures who have their own ways of doing things and humans slowly spreading and killing these monsters and creating civilizations. And it's getting to the point in this world where there are fewer and fewer monsters, so the demand to even have a Witcher is far less at this point. Geralt is struggling to find certain jobs at this point because there's just not a lot of monsters. People are very advanced and uh, more civilized. Of course, there's going to be more monsters still here and there, but the world is becoming more domesticated by the human hand. And I want to move that on to the next point of the dryads, or dryads, I believe they're called. They are a species of forest dwellers. I think it's mostly a matriarchy. It's mostly like women. And they use bows and arrows, and they're super fast and strong and agile, and they traverse this forest called Brocolon or Brocolon, a huge forest that seems to expand for miles. Geralt is actually a quaint, like an acquaintance with the ruler of this forest, Queen Ethne, I believe her name is. And I think there was some interaction in the past where Geralt was 
potentially romantically involved with Queen Ethne's daughter. And so Geralt has a reputation with these people, but the queen is basically talking about, you know, the human invaders trying to take out the land and cut down the forests. And these people, this is sacred ground to them that has been, been there for millennia, even more than obviously humans have been there. And so whenever humans are going through the woods or kind of approaching the forest line, the dryads are just killing them down and shooting them with bows. And we kind of get to see their point of view of things. And this is where Ciri is introduced into the plot. Ciri is a very important character in the game, in the show. And I think it was interesting for this introduction because it seemed relatively like an unimportant event. She was kind of in the forest and in trouble and Geralt happened to be around and protect and save her and Geralt didn't know who she was. Ciri, I think she might have known who Geralt was because her granddaughter or grandmother talked about him and this whole concept of destiny. So the book is called Sword of Destiny and destiny, especially in the latter half of the book, plays an extremely large role through the lens of Geralt because he is questioning himself, questioning the whole concept of destiny he doesn't believe in it, he believes in death. That is what he knows, and it's what he is expecting, you know? He, he knows he's gonna die. He doesn't have a lot of strong, like, spiritual compasses towards it's a thing as destiny. He always views it as, if there is destiny, there has to be something more than just destiny. And Siri starts to bring this up, like, you're my destiny, you're my destiny, and Geralt's like, hmm, I don't know about this. And there's the whole concept of the child of surprise, where when you, like, go home, you will receive whatever is not expected. It's something along the lines of that. And Geralt is very unsure of that, and he you know, save Ciri from becoming a dryad because they wanted to integrate her into the culture and force her to become one and brainwash her. But Geralt luckily got her out of that situation and she was brought back to Sintra. And then it leads kind of to the last portion of the book where he's on the road and he saves this merchant, but then there's all these zombies and they start trying to kill them and the witcher is trying to kill them and they like bite his leg like they bite a huge chunk of his leg off and there's this whole sequence of him being bedridden and trying to go uh get somewhere safe to recover and he tells the merchant to give him this hallucinogenic uh, potion in his clothes and so he takes this hallucinogenic potion and he's basically transported first to be with Yennefer and there's this whole festival with sorcerers and then it's this whole sequence um, about destiny. He's talking with Queen Calanthe about it. And I think there's even mention about his mother, which hasn't been brought up yet, but Geralt's own mother. We're not even sure how old Geralt is at this point, but he's, he's probably nearing 100 years old or something like that. Uh, I don't think it was explicitly mentioned yet, but I'm sure it will be. But anyways, he kind of wakes up from this delirium and there's this sorceress who's healing him and taking care of his leg. And she has like red hair and it's a very kind of odd sense in the scene. Geralt is asking to, if he can look her in the eyes. And I don't know, when I first read it, I thought there was like a romantic tension because it seems like Geralt is always trying to like find something in someone to kind of be romantically involved with. And that was, also brought up with a dandelion's friend, uh, I think her name was Essie. Yeah, Essie the poet. Uh, earlier in the book, Essie is madly in love with Geralt, and Geralt didn't really reciprocate those feelings, and he kind of, it was a very important plot point in my point of view, because he viewed how he felt about Essie, like this unreciprocated love that she feels for him, but he doesn't quite feel for her as how Yennefer views Geralt. Uh, Geralt is madly in love with Yennefer, but Yennefer is a little standoffish and doesn't quite reciprocate the same affection that Geralt 
wants to give to Yennefer. So I think that was a good point for Geralt to kind of be a little bit more empathetic about his own situation there with Yennefer. But anyways, moving back to that point, it turns out that this sorceress who is healing Geralt is actually his mother. And his mother turned into a sorceress, so she wasn't able to bear children. But before that, she gave birth to Geralt and brought him into the, the whole Witcher kind of setup. And I thought that was a really interesting plot point. I didn't expect to see Geralt's mom. Um, I think her name was Vicenna, but we'll probably see her in the future because it was left a little bit open-ended. But I could kind of see some sort of connotation with this character as kind of like a guardian angel figure. She seemed elusively brought into the plot to save him and then elusively gone again. Uh, anyways, this leads into the final part of the book where Geralt is reunited with Ciri under the precursor of this destiny, child of surprise thing being completely and perfectly laid out into reality, which basically signifies to Geralt, it, it breaks through all of his biases regarding destiny being a thing, and it basically shoves it in his face as, this is what's happening. Yes, there's destiny. There, this is more than just destiny at this point, which was exactly what Geralt was looking for. And it's a really sweet moment between them, and that's basically how the book ends. So Geralt is mostly reinvigorated with this sense of meaning of life and what he's meant to do. In these first two books, he's mostly wandering around looking for work, not really feeling like he has a place in the world anymore and a lot of self-doubt and self-criticism. And I'm sure we're gonna see that as the plot continues because you don't just magically fix that stuff. But I think leading into the third book, Blood of Elves, I believe it's called. Yeah, Blood of Elves. We're gonna see a different kind of Geralt and I'm excited to see that. And I'm excited to make some more videos about the Witcher series. I'm also reading the uh, the Song of Ice and Fire series, once again, by George R. R. Martin. I am on the second book right now. I might do some videos about that because I love that series. I am in love with the show since I was a kid. Um, and I just want to read the books just to kind of get that better nuanced take on it. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are currently reading the Witcher series or you've read it in the past, let me know down below, did you enjoy the series? Were there any like plot points in these first two books that I might may have glossed over that you think were really important if you read the books? Um, but yeah, anyways, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for watching if you're still here. I make whatever videos I feel like making at the time, so if you're down to watch some more, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I'm pushing to a thousand subscribers. And also like the video if you enjoyed it, or dislike it if you didn't. Either way, it helps me out. Anyways, peace.